parish council meeting, and you're very welcome. Uh, as a warm welcome from your councillor Wormsley from, I'm not sure your first name. Alistair. Oh, Alistair? Yeah. From Lenham, so welcome. Uh, before we have the public discussion, we'll just have the reports from our um, rural warden and PCSO. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. We've asked, been asked by uh, CEOP, which is the Child Exploitation and Online, Online Protection Centre, to um, promote their uh, website about uh, giving advice to parents so that they could advise their children how to use the internet safely. Um, I've given uh, Amanda a copy of the um, website um, for inclusion in the minutes. Um, there's a, a good lot of resources on there for parents, but I wanted to mention it in particular because um, you may have noticed that there's uh, rather a lot of young people uh, going around with mobile phones um, looking for Pokemon on, <laughs> on a game called Pokemon Go. Um, I have spoken to a couple of uh, youngsters in the village um, that were walking down the road without a footpath um, concentrating more on their own, uh, mobile phones than the vehicles that were approaching them. So I just gave them a, g a gentle reminder of uh, trying to keep um, them safe. Um, but there was also a couple in Lenham this evening on their own cycling around looking at mobile phones every now and again as well. So if any of you have got children or grandchildren that are interested in that, it might be an idea to encourage them to go round in at least pairs um, so that they've uh, got a friend with them rather than going off on their own. I think overall it's a good thing because it gets them off the couch and sort of out in the fresh air but um, obviously as with anything there's uh, sort of could be some element of risk in it. So uh, there's a website it's called thinkyknow.co.uk forward slash parents um, but uh, it, it's uh, public access so anybody can have a look at it if, if they want to give someone some advice or point them in the right direction. Um, the other thing is, on, on Saturday I went to uh, on a training course, part of which was uh, involved in uh, identifying vulnerable people that um, might need assistance in case there was an emergency. Um, one of the things that they mentioned um, was that UK Power Networks have got um, a facility on their website to register vulnerable people. So if there's uh, a power cut, um, then um, if they're registered, what happens is our, our emergency planning people and the police have got a list of lists. So they don't hold individual names and addresses and contact details of people that might need assistance. But they would ask UK Power Networks, for example, have you got any vulnerable people registered in this postcode area because we might need to evacuate. Um, so if, if they can go online and register as UK Power Networks, if they can't, I'm more than happy to print the form off and go around and out and fill it in. Thanks very much. Is it a way of us identifying? I, th I think Harry was quite lucky because the fish scheme have got people that can identify vulnerable people. So I will be talking to um, Marjorie, which usually is the one I contact. But if any of you know someone that's not on the radar otherwise um, and think they might need to do that, there's a, on the website there's a list of um, people that might be included but they finish off with um, uh, a group of people that they're prepared to consider if, if they're not listed for certain reasons as well. But um, as I say, it, it might keep someone on the radar. We had someone a couple of years ago when Yalding flooded, um, one of my colleagues found uh, an old chap that nobody knew was there um, so, and, and he needed evacuating because of the flooding. So, um, the more chances we've got of identifying people that might need some help, I think the better. So. Is there a data protection issue? Well, this is, this is why I'm saying that if, if someone wanted to go on the website either themselves or with family and register, mm -hmm. then it's their decision yeah. whether they publish their, include their details on the UK Power Network register themselves, or I could give them the form and then they can choose whether to sign it or not. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. There was two main incidents of our crime reports this last month. Um, one was the aggravated robbery down Marley Road 
Um, I don't know if people are aware of this at all, uh, but just to put some people's minds at rest about uh, the female being there on her own. She had a few family there, but um, it, they were after a certain, I have to be careful what I say, because it is an ongoing investigation. <coughs> and we do have leads which we are following. Uh, but they were, they were after certain things. They weren't actually, she were, they, were, they were not going to premises because she was there on her own. They were after something specific, uh, which is why they went on there. Uh, but so like I say, we do have, it is an ongoing investigation and we do have leads which we are progressing through. So, um, you know, there are many, many things happening. Uh, there were many things involved in that robbery. It was not just a plain, simple robbery. There were many other different incidents involved in it. So um, that did take up quite a few, it's an aggravated robbery. It did take up quite a few of the, the incidents involved in this crime report. And of course, the nuisance vehicles at Wunham Lane and Sandway Road, um, <laughs> This time of year now, we're back onto, onto that again. It's an on, ongoing thing. We've been in contact with the landowner, been in contact with the council. Uh, there are many vehicles keep being reported, being seen there. I've been around many houses, knocked on doors, and given words of advice not to use the land. And I know my colleagues are doing the same. So we're getting onto as much as we can, and hopefully we've got in, um, we'll be on top of that, hopefully very soon. And I said there's 14 cities in total. Um, there was one on RTC at Dickley Road and a port of bad driving. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. I've got to be very 15 for you. Are you staying? Thanks very much. See you in September. We haven't got a meeting. We've now got 15 minutes of public questions. Is there anyone who wants? Um, it's not a question. You've got an item on the agenda, item 5.5, which is an individual plan application, which is quite unusual to come to the council, but I just wondered if it was possible to make some comments on it before we debate it. Again, if it's come to the parish council, if the planning committee aren't in the with their decision, then it has to come to the council. Yeah, okay, so, so I'm concerned at what I've always called planning by stealth, which I've seen a lot of over the last few years um, in this parish and in this borough generally, where landowners um, end up with approved development over a period of time, basically by securing approval in stages, pushing the boundaries a little bit each time until they end up with something that should never have been approved in the first place. So this application is on the Fairborn Manor site, which is a small cluster of rural properties in a very rural setting. And when you first look at it, the application seems reasonable enough. It's asking for a double garage with a storeroom and a room above it to replace a previously approved outbuilding. And I suspect this sort of application would normally just slip through. But when you look at the detail, it's actually quite worrying because the original approved garage was a modest size and a single storey. And it was clearly subservient in scale to the main building. But the new building is 7 metres deep by 11 metres wide and a full two storeys with a height of 6.6 .6 metres, six dormer windows, three on the front, three on the, three on the back, and two flank windows. Um, in my language, that is about 23 feet deep and 36 feet wide. In other words, it's the size of a modern four-bed detached house. Um, so I would ask councillors to consider, in, consider the following policies. Maidstone's Residential Extensions Supplementary Planning Document 2009, Section 5, Extensions in the Countryside, states that outbuildings must be modest in relation to the main residential pro property, and they define modest as having a footprint of 50% or less. The footprint of this building is about 70 to 80% of the main building, therefore it's not modest. It doesn't matter that it's in a large plot, it's the size of the outbuilding in relation to the main property that's relevant. 
The supplementary planning document also states that outbuildings will not be permitted if they create a separate dwelling or one of a scale and type that is capable of being used in the future as a separate dwelling. And I think this building clearly could be used as a separate dwelling. Um, the third point under this policy is that additional outbuildings will not be permitted if the impact of the development would be visually incongruous or harm the character of the area. The Fairbourne Manor site has already had a number of additional developments and I think the cumulative impact of this proposal will cause harm. So all I would ask is that there are existing policies that can be used to inform and guide the discussion and I would ask all the councillors to give that consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Are those mandatory, what you just said, or recommended? I'll just ask him a question. Mm -hmm. Are they mandatory or they're, recommended? They're policies, and as you policies know... Policies meaning what? The same as any Maidstone adopted plan like Environment 28, building in the countryside, they're what should be used to guide and inform planning decisions. They're not always, because ultimately if they go to the planning committee, <coughs> and the officer has reason to override them, they can be overridden. So exactly the same as you can choose to ignore them tonight, if you oh, wish. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Um, back in December, I think it was, the Parish Council voted unanimously to move the uh, meetings to the school hall. Um, some of the reasons cited were that it was a bigger venue, more room, less noise from the karate club, and there was a marginal saving to parishioners money-wise as well. Um, that hasn't actually happened yet, and I, I asked at the April meeting whether, whether that was going to happen, and you said that you decided <coughs> not to move. Um, at the time, I said that that decision needs to be made in public. If, if you are going to reverse it, then that needs to be made at a meeting. Um, and I just wonder whether you've got that minuted to, um, or whether you will minute it after this, just to discuss that. And also bear in mind that the village hall is now subject to a drinks licence, which may hinder um, your meetings here. Um, I, I know that um, the parish councils aren't allowed to um, have meetings in a... In a oh, we'll have a booze up. <laughs> yeah, they're not allowed to have meetings in a, um, in a building that's got, got an alcohol licence. So whether no, that's going to affect incorrect. you or not, I don't know. It's something you need to look into, I think. Well, yeah, that's not actually correct. If there's nowhere else available, you can use a public house. Yeah, but there is somewhere else available. So. No, but you said they can't be used. Can. If there's nobody else okay, available, we'll, I agree with you there. Yeah, but as I just said, you agreed to move to the uh, school hall, yeah. so we, we are aware that there's somebody else available. What reason have you got of not using the village hall then, rather than using the school? Uh, well, it, it's not my reason. I'm going back to the unanimous decision of the council in December. They, they decided to to move on the grounds of, of a marginal cost saving to the, the public, uh, a, a bigger room, um, as you can see tonight we're at capacity, and also um, the noise factor, so it's not necessarily my, uh, my desire to want to go to the, uh, the school hall, I'm just uh, chasing up something that was decided at the previous meeting. Um, Mr Joe. There's various other parish councils in Kent and meeting halls that also have licensed bar, um, particularly different parish council, um, as well as the bar is closed, and so I can to do that. And as for our next meeting being minuted, where it's being moved to, you'll notice on each of the agendas, like item 15 tonight, it says date of next meeting, it's Wednesday, 20th of September, 7.30, in the Blue Four. So it's actually part of our minutes of each meeting to say where we're going to be meeting next. I thought we decided that we wouldn't go to the school because it wasn't available. And we made a decision, so why are we going over it again? 
Well, because the decision wasn't made at a public well, meeting, now. Uh, and so it doesn't stand. Yeah. Do you want to put it on the list? Okay. Okay. Can I just fill, fill you in on that? Um, the, the chairman actually said, uh, this wasn't my board, and I'm just filling you in with because I was the chair of the uh, comms committee, <coughs> and I was the one that put this forward as a proposal. We're moving for a better venue, and we're moving to, to encourage more people to come. And there was a cost saving, but that wasn't the reason. And also the noise from next door, which you can actually hear on the videos, Grant in the background. Tonight, I think you'll be surprised if they're not on there. But uh, the chairman said at the April meeting that he'd come back and report back to committee because it actually muddled everything up in terms of the reasons why it was going to the school, i.e. it wasn't a saving when it was. And to answer Council Trust's point, it was available, and the school said that they would, would um, allow the council to use it, but it was just reversed without any reporting back or any council decision. So I think probably the point James is making is that the chairman hasn't reported back in three months, and there was no council decision to reverse uh, the original decision. How many more people are going to come? <laughs> Sands and uh, Eddie Powell. Right. Item three, minutes of the last meeting. Can we have a proposal, please? Seconder. Seconder. All those in favour? Financial decision that's going to be taken tonight, and I will not take part in the discussions because I am the trustee to do the report. Um, I think that is it at the moment. I'll keep this open depending on which way the conversation is going. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, so I asked everyone to have a look at the application before this evening. I've got it here with the end. Quick refresh. I've been doing that now. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's where I'm working. At the planning meeting, we had a look and the original application from 2005, um, there was an application 2005 and an application 2010, um, it doesn't appear to be built. So, where is it the meeting council's been concerned at the fact that the agriculture equipment would no longer be found in the building, because that's what it was originally asked for, um, that building was never built anyway. Well, let's, let's put the colours on the table. There are three against and one for. There's, and I guess those, that is slow as it is. And so it's only Mac that might, or Mac and Mike, that might change the vote to a. Uh, uh, on the square. I was the one that voted for um, because the reasons given were what happened in the past, speculative, and what might happen in the future, which are all things that, according to the education environment, are the things that you ignore. You look at the application on the table and you make a judgment.